Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Center for Research Libraries webinar on print and digital archiving. My name is Gwen Einat, and I'm the communication specialist here at CRL. You've probably seen my name at the bottom of a few emails before this event. Uh, so I'd really like to thank you for joining us today. This webinar is a program of the CRL Global Resources Forum. The forum is a set of resources and activities that support collection-related decision-making and investment by individual libraries and library consortia. The forum is supported by, in part by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and we have more information about the forum on our website, www.crl.edu slash forum, F-O-R-U-M. So we'd like to welcome you today to today's webinar. We just a few technical details to go over. Your phones have been muted on entry. Uh, we do this to eliminate a lot of background noise, so if, but we encourage you to ask questions and submit comments to our presenters, which you can do during the online chat. And we will be addressing uh, these comments and questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, the audio for this webinar is available through your phone line, not your computer, but if you can hear me, you already know that. Um, but if you have any technical difficulties throughout today's presentation, um, again, please submit any commentary through the online chat. You can also call CRL's main number at 800-621-6044, uh, where we do have an operator standing by. Uh, today's presentations will be kicked off by Lizanne Payne. Ms. Payne has served as consultant to CRL's print archiving initiatives since 2009. The goal of these initiatives is to significantly reduce costs, increase accessibility, and foster long-term preservation of journals, newspapers, and government documents for scholars and researchers in the CRL community. She has extensive experience in developing print archives programs, including serving as project manager for the Western Regional Storage Trust, or WEST, as a member of the coordinating committee for the OCLC print archives pilot, and as a consultant to the Committee on Institutional Cooperation Shared Print Repository Program. Then Lizanne will be followed by two of our CRL staff members. Lizanne actually will be calling in from uh, DC, and I have the staff members here with me in Chicago. Uh, Amy Wood is Director of Technical Services at the Center for Research Libraries. She is also the Project Director of two IMLS Leadership Grants, Print Archiving by Domain, and the ICON Global Newspaper Directory. She's been with the Center since 2002, and prior to that, she worked as a cataloger on the Chicago Daily News Digitization and Cataloging Project at the Chicago History Museum and at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. CRL Projects Librarian Marie Waltz has worked at CRL since 2002. Among other responsibilities, she is currently working on CRL's efforts in the area of certification of digital repositories. In addition to this project, she has worked on a variety of projects relating to both digital and print repositories. And so without further ado, I now turn it over to Lizanne. Thank you, Gwen. Um, if I've done this correctly, I'm no longer muted and people can can hear me. Yes. <laughs> um, I want to give an overview today of uh, many of the shared print or print archiving programs that are underway and talk about an emerging infrastructure to support these, these programs and begin to knit them together into a, a, more, a more global whole. As many of you know, there are, there's a large number of print archiving programs underway already. And in this table, I'm showing you uh, the, the names of some of them. I'm sure there, there, are, there are many that I left off. This is, these are just some highlights. And they're, they're grouped here, uh, looking, looking left to right in sort of increasing order of proactive activity. Um, they're grouped and displayed here in terms of uh, how these programs have, have identified or selected the materials that they are archiving. So on, on the far left, um, the, uh, the, the, the least proactive tend to be those where there was an existing shared storage facility uh, which established a retention agreement to cover the materials in storage or some of them. And so there's a number of those, the University of California Regional Library Facilities you know, are the, are the oldest of that kind, and a number of other uh, consortia have established a similar program. Um, some of the other programs are uh, sort of volunteer.
voluntary library nominated programs where individual participants will say the following titles are important to our program and therefore we agree to to maintain them for the duration of the the agreed time period so those those I'm calling library nominated titles some others um, Becoming more proactive, uh, the, a large number of them identify the pr titles to be archived based on their uh, publisher grouping, and very often these relate to titles for which there is a digital equivalent. And uh, the, the presence of the digital equivalent drives archiving of the corresponding print copies. Some other approaches are um, uh, to archive materials organized around format. Um, CRL's Newspaper Directory Project, an IMLS grant, is one of those, and ACERL's Collaborative Federal Depository Program is, is another one which is focusing on, on government documents. And there's a handful that are taking their own sort of customized approaches. Uh, the, the Western Regional Storage Trust has identified a set of risk management categories which bring a number of factors into play, including whether the material is available electronically or not, and um, it has established a, a sort of a, a, a table of possible uh, risk categories that determine the level of archiving to be applied. Um, CRL is launching a, a an IMLS-funded program uh, to archive in two separate domains, agriculture and, and law, and that's the one that Amy will be talking about later. And actually, the ACERL Collaborative Federal Depository Program is, is sort of domain-based as well, because in many cases, the participants are choosing to archive uh, government docs in a certain uh, subject area um, that may have actually been issued across different uh, government agencies. Um, and the Hathi Trust Print Management Program is, is a sort of an incipient uh, plan that's being discussed to, uh, to drive print archiving from the monograph holdings of the Hathi Trust. And a, a project is being developed that will be considered by the, the Hathi Trust members at their constitutional convention uh, next month. Next, please. Um, a number of programs... Uh, are covering um, a, an area that might be called mega-regional. The, um, the existing CIC consortium covers a large number of libraries in the, in the Midwest and a and couple that might be considered the East or Mid-Atlantic. Um, ACERL, the Association of Southeastern Research Libraries, covers a, a large number of states in the Southeast. And the Western Regional Storage Trust covers perhaps the largest geographic area and also incorporates libraries that are members of several other consortia, such as the Orbis Cascade Alliance and most of the members of GWILA and some members of, of uh, Skelk. So the, what, what's starting to happen is that the, uh, the print archiving initiatives are, are starting to coalesce to cover larger and larger areas. Next, please. All of these print archiving programs or, or shared print programs, um, and you'll hear me use both terms. Both, both terms are, are current, are common in this uh, community. Uh, some people have started to feel like archives means something else and is therefore confusing, and so some programs are using the terminology shared print, but I'm using them sort of interchangeably in this um, in this presentation until the terminology sort of sorts itself out. Um, all of these programs need to consider various attributes as part of their definition of the program. They all define certain uh, attributes that determine how the archiving program will work, and I'm calling that the operating plan, and they also have to determine an administrative plan, how, it, how it's managed. The operating plan includes uh, a definition of how materials are selected for the archive. That was the, the kind of outline I gave a couple of, of slides ago about choosing by publisher or by format. Um, 
each program has to also define what qualifies as an archiving location. It can be um, a program that requires a high-density environmentally controlled storage facility, or it can be a program that allows uh, archiving in place within library collections or, or a combination of both. Validation means how much uh, effort is given to reviewing the archived materials for completeness and condition. And it can range from no validation up through very detailed page level review of materials before going into the archive. Um, whatever choice is made, it's, it's in each case a, a question that has to be considered, how much or how little validation will be done. Disclosure and discovery means how does the program and its participating libraries make information available to the participants and to other libraries about what has been archived. And I'm going to talk quite a bit about this part later on. That's a big piece of the infrastructure that's, um, that's evolving at this point. And last but certainly not least, the operating plan needs to consider what kind of access and delivery will be made available from this archive. In terms of the administrative plan, the, the retention period is, I think, the, the single thing that defines a, a print archive or a shared print program versus uh, an agreement for a shared storage operation, for instance. The, it's, it's the presence of a retention agreement that uh, makes these materials archived, as opposed to merely held until some future, uh, future other decision. Um, ownership, the ownership question always comes up, who will, uh, will own these materials? Um, and the business model means uh, how costs of running the archive and creating the archive are shared, or are they shared? Governance means uh, what provisions are made for making decisions about this archive going forward, who, who will, what, what uh, categories and um, and uh, individuals will, uh, will govern the shared print program. Next, please. Uh, given that sort of template of how uh, these uh, materials work, uh, the, these programs work, I wanted to highlight the way the majority of them have defined their program. In terms of selection, it's mostly, so far, it's mostly been by publisher. The largest number of, of print archiving programs are driving their selection based upon publisher groupings. Uh, in terms of retention, it, most of them have defined a, a specified term. You know, for X num We will keep this material for X number of years. And at the moment, at least, the most common term that's in been put in place is uh, 25 years. There's, there seems to be a sort of a ad hoc feeling that 25 years is um, long enough into the future to uh, be able to uh, direct current collection management decisions. But going along with that is a sense that uh, the technology and other things might change enough in 25 years that it would be worth reconsidering at that point. Ownership, the, almost all of them leave ownership with the original owning library. And by and large, that is just to avoid the political issues and, uh, that attendant on the whole ownership question. It's just most, most of the programs talk about it and hash out the, uh, the pros and cons and end up saying, well, let's just leave it the ownership with the original owning library. Access and delivery, most of these are light archives uh, with the material available through some form of interlibrary loan process. The, there are one or two that are dark archives. Um, the University of Minnesota is um, establishing a, a dark archive system. Um, Halsey and Ohio Link have in, the, in their programs have a provision for keeping two copies of the specified journals, and one of them is considered a dark archive. 
but by and large, these print archiving programs are keeping um, light archives, and the primary reason is that uh, fellow participants wouldn't feel able to deselect their own corresponding materials if they didn't feel like they had a an obvious way to get access to those materials when they needed them and, with, and are reluctant to rely on access to a dark archive. In terms of the business model, the, um, the vastly most common approach is that libraries absorb their own costs, that no money changes hands. Um, next, please. Um, sorry, I was, I've got a slide in between. <laughs> um, I wanted to give you an, an idea for those three mega regional programs, how they stack up on some of these attributes. And I particularly want to mention a couple of things about the business model when we get there. Um, West, the CIC Shared Print Repository, and the ACERL program. ACERL actually has two print archiving programs going on now. One is uh, the library-nominated journal, collaborative journal retention program, and the other is the Federal Depository Government Docs Program. Um, these particular attributes for ACERL relate to the journal retention one. Um, so you can see West has a, a large number of libraries, um, something around 100, a little over 100. Um, CIC has 10 out of their 13 members participating in the CIC SPR, and the ACERL program uh, is for the, the 38 ACERL members. Uh, all of these uh, are using storage facilities um, as their base, but, also, but West and the ACERL program also allow for archiving within campus libraries. Um, they all have said 25 years is their time period. Um, the the uh, access that they're providing is uh, basically through interlibrary loan. Uh, CIC SPR is still wor working through the, uh, the the program that they want to offer there. Um, of these three, ACERL follows the the plan that most of them do, which is that there is no cost sharing. Each library absorbs their own costs. Um, but West and CIC Shared Print Repository have a, a business model that involves members sharing the costs. Next one, please. Um, the, while they're fairly similar, in both, ca in both cases, they, um, they share the costs of creating these archives, that is, the, the transaction costs of accessions and validation and so forth. Um, but there's a key difference between them, and that is that for West, um, the, the costs that West shares across its members are, are front-loaded. They are, they are the costs of creating these archives in the first place, and there's um, essentially no long-term subsidy to the archive holders. The perceived advantage there was to, uh, to facilitate financial sustainability in the sense that to not build in costs that would still be occurring 15 years from now and 20 years from now that the libraries would need to share. So um, the, the idea was to uh, share the upfront costs and minimize the long-term costs. Um, the CIC approach, while they do also share the costs of the creation, Part of the cost they share is a financial contribution to Indiana University to compensate them for the, the cost of the space that Indiana University is making available for this group archive. The advantage of that approach is that it, it, it provides better encouragement to archiving entities to, to take on that, that responsibility of maintaining the, the materials long term. Next, please. For all of these um, print archives programs, there is uh, an evolving infrastructure to support 
ultimately integration of them into a, a, more, a more global and, and seamless whole. Uh, and CRL is playing a, a critical role in, in supporting these, these activities. There's basically two categories of activities. One is um, providing a community forum for print archiving programs to discuss priorities and standards and best practices. And the other is that's needed is an information infrastructure to support um, resource sharing and uh, uh, decision support collection analysis and collection management. Next, please. CRL's work to support the, the Print Archives Community Forum um, takes a couple of different forms. CRL is hosting a listserv called the Print Archives Network that I believe many of you are, are on. Um, uh, if, if, you'd, if you're not on it and you'd like to join, feel free to, to send me an email and I will, will add you or send you information about subscribing yourself. Um, and CRL is also offering this new Global Resources Forum program that Gwen mentioned at the introduction, which is a CRL program in which non-CRL libraries may participate. In other words, it doesn't require full CRL membership. And it has a number of, of uh, important and, and valuable features and services, but one of the ones that relates specifically to print archiving is a sequence of community discussions that we're launching to talk about some key issues related to print archiving. The first of these is going to be on October 6th, and we'll talk in some detail about the bibliographic infrastructure that's developing and, um, and how to use it and, and, and how it's expected to work. Next, please. And I want to give an overview of that bibliographic uh, infrastructure here today. Um, Basically, there are two complementary efforts underway um, at, that are both national level projects that are intended to support the information needs of print archiving uh, programs and, and libraries. One of them is um, a, 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 a pilot project at OCLC um, that's intended to uh, provide a metadata standard for disclosing print archiving commitments through WorldCat. And the other is a uh, print archives preservation registry system being developed by CRL, which uh, will include a, a registry, descriptive registry about print archiving programs, but also provides an ability to, to analyze collections and um, provide uh, supportive reports for individual libraries and consortia about what they uh, what they might want to archive and what they might want to deselect. Next, please. The OCLC Print Archives pilot project is underway right now. It's uh, it's going on through the summer and fall of 2011. And basically, the idea is that um, libraries will provide cataloging information in the form of local holding records to WorldCat um, that, and these, these materials, these archive materials will be, archi will be associated with a new OCLC institution symbol that will be defined uh, in a way that's, that indicates that this is a location slash status um, that, that indicates that this material is, is print archived or in a shared print program. Um, there is the, the basic archiving commitment information will be contained in a 583 action note uh, in, in some combination of one, two, or three 583 action notes, which will indicate that the item is retained. Um, if it was validated for completeness, there will be another 583 that indicates um, the results of the completeness check. And if it was validated for condition, uh, there will be a third 583 action note indicating the results of the, of the condition validation. So the level of effort put into the validation is um, reflected in the, in the uh, local holding record. Um, this will then make that material available through OCLC resource sharing, through um, existing capabilities like uh, custom 
lender strings and group access capabilities and and uh, and that sort of thing. So uh, these materials will be put into the WorldCat database and then available through any of the interfaces that access the WorldCat database, like WorldCat.org, like uh, First Search, like Connection, and so forth. Next, please. Um, the uh, CRL paper project is oriented more toward collection analysis. And uh, CRL is partnering with the California Digital Library to design and develop paper and using and is using the or working with the uh, the West program as a joint development partner such that West will be using the the uh, paper collection analysis service to support its next round of of archiving decisions which is happening this fall next please I want to give you just a real quick overview of screenshots of the um, paper directory service that's uh, uh, that that is in process. It, this is uh, a draft. It, well, not a draft, but it's a it's a a not yet complete <laughs> um, uh, software product. But I wanted to give you some screenshots of of where it is now. Um, the paper directory will let you uh, search by uh, programs or consortia or libraries or facilities that are involved in print archiving and will also let you search and display archive titles. This particular screen is a list of, of a small subset of the archiving programs. Next, please. Um, for any given program, it will display uh, descriptive information about that program. This one is the, the West program, and it includes uh, a, a link to, the, to view the titles un archived under that program. And down in the middle, there's a link to the MOU for that program and some descriptive information about the kind of validation that's defined under that program and the consortia and libraries that are related to that program. Next, please. Um, you can search the archive titles by a number of different fields. It's a single box search uh, into which you can enter basically keywords. Next, please. Um, this is a title list summary uh, for, I just I did a search for West, so this is just you know, sort of a title summary of titles archived under West. Next. Um, for any given title, once you select it, it will show you which programs are archiving that title. So even though I, I searched this originally under West, when I look at a particular title, it shows me all the programs that are archiving the same title. Um, and some uh, summary holdings information about that. Uh, what 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 summary holdings are being archived by by each program, and some more details of the title level. Next, please. And uh, it, the title details for this title. You can look you can look for the the details of how this particular title was archived under this particular program, and it will show you what action was taken, like it, down at the bottom, this one was marked as retained. Um, and this data was taken from the 583 information, um, the, which is the same information as provided to uh, OCLC WorldCat. Next, please. Um, the main service of the paper system is not something that can really be shown on a demo or a screenshot, because it's it's the, the batch holdings comparisons uh, where individual libraries would provide their their um, holdings records to be compared against what's already archived and against other holdings within their consortium. Given a set of consortial criteria, paper then would output reports uh, consisting of archiving proposals, meaning you know, given this consortium's approach, uh, what titles and what archive holders are proposed, and deselection reports would be um, lists for uh, participating libraries of materials that they might consider deselecting because the material's already been archived elsewhere. Next, please. The development schedule for paper, um, it's well underway at this point, as I mentioned. Um, the the uh, 
development work with West is uh, in process now this fall. We've loaded about 40 files, uh, library, files from about 40 libraries uh, that are West members and as part of the uh, collection analysis that we'll be doing shortly. Um, the intention is that the West collection, the paper collection analysis service will be available to other libraries and consortia uh, by June of 2012. And similarly, for the directory and online searching capability that I showed you the screenshots of, it, that's also expected to be available by June of 2012, if not before. Next, please. So that, um, that's all just a way of summarizing um, the kinds of infrastructure that's uh, beginning to be put in place to, to leverage these separate print archiving programs uh, to the point where we can, can get to, to a broader scale. We, we're, we're all working toward getting to a point where the overlap between digital collections and library collections and existing print archives can be used as the basis of uh, collection management decisions in individual libraries uh, around the country or indeed around the world. And that's, uh, that's the summation for me. I think we decided to have questions at the end after all the presentations. So um, at this point, I will hand it over to Amy Wood to talk about CRL's IMLS uh, project by domain. Good afternoon. I'm Amy Wood, Director of Technical Services at CRL. In 2010, CRL was awarded a two-year Institute of Museum and Library Services National Leadership Program grant to establish a model for cooperative, coordinated management of physical collections in two major fields of research, law and agriculture. With the support of this grant, we are building a sustainable and scalable plan for cooperative management of legacy print materials at the local, state, regional, and national levels. A key component of the infrastructure is the paper database that Lizanne just discussed. The project was designed to support the concept that institutions with similar commitments to supporting the research and teaching of a particular discipline have an inherent shared interest in preserving the resources of those disciplines. And that shared interest has the potential to enable print archives based on discipline to create stronger institutional commitments to the material, create stronger ties among partners, and to provide more services or information related to the collections than archives based on a focus that may not be related to the mission of the institution. Agriculture and law as disciplines have had very different publishing histories and very different histories of developing and managing cooperative preservation projects among interested institutions. By addressing the needs of both at Project's End, we will have created a flexible framework applicable to a variety of situations because we have addressed very different sets of needs during the project. And often it seems as though we have two very different projects, one for agriculture and one for law, because the scope of content, the participants, and the, the details or the particulars of the outcomes for both disciplines are different. However, they are tied together in the development of the infrastructure or what we think of as the tangible outcomes of the project. And we want those invested in other disciplines or other projects within agriculture and law to take what was developed by the participants of this project and adapt it for their own uses. The tangible outcomes or the infrastructure, these are, these are the tools that will enable key stakeholders and supporting institutions to manage and develop their collections cooperatively. These tools help potential partners assess the holdings, types of services, and levels of commitment available in order to make decisions about how best to provide their patrons with the resources they need. When we were first awarded the grant, we had questions about what types of terms for archiving agreements and standards which CRL would be promoting. But CR CRL's role, as explored in this grant, is to help participants prioritize projects and develop service agreements and archiving standards that make sense for their community or discipline. 
we are supporting realistic deliverable term standards that can be financially supported by the community and that will allow various levels of supporting partners a sample of the questions we expect these tools will help answer are is it more cost effective for an institution to support the preservation of material at another institution rather than hold it locally what risk criteria or standards of excellence should be used to determine whether another institution is and always will be reliable in hosting resources? And if material is held by more than one institution or in more than one format, from whom is my institution best served or should multiple hosting agencies receive my support? When is it best that my institution becomes the one to preserve and make accessible particular material? And who will support that work? In the case where we do become the institution of preservation, what type of services should we offer and to whom? The scope of content of the project focuses on serials identified in the CL CHLA digital and USANE microfilm preservation projects, as well as the material digitized and microfilmed by LLMC. This material was determined to be of essential historical value to their respective fields, either at a national, state, or local level. And because of the importance of the material, it is also of interest to researchers and scholars in other disciplines who can help support the preservation of this material. Considerable work has been done to identify and preserve this material already. The collection development and management tools developed in this project will support the work of the key stakeholders, those currently preserving the material, and hopefully broaden the support of this work to institutions whose scholars will depend on the existence and access accessibility of this work. A list of specific titles addressed in this project are available on our web pages, for which there will be a URL listing at the end of the presentation. And I think every project that involves the production of a database or content for a database must struggle with identifying or even limiting the scope of the data to use as a test or first run. And so we have in this project. However, at a recent web meeting with our agricultural participants, I asked for comments on our choice of projects for our content scope. And rather than answer directly, one participant reminded the others that in the course of working on the USAIN microfilming project, extensive bibliographies of titles deemed important for agricultural scholarship were developed and all of the resources listed in those bibliographies could not be included in the microfilming projects for various reasons like funding, availability, and condition. However, this project, with this project, there is a way of bringing those bibliographies to light by including the bibliographic records and supporting archiving conditions and services information for the material listed um, in those bibliographies. Once the information is there and readily accessible, it will support the development of future cooperative preservation projects. And while I didn't get a direct answer to my question, I, I got something better. Someone was already thinking of some, something better to do with the tools still in development. Although these collections are important to many institutions, we have begun our work with a few key participants and welcome more. Participants commit to providing records or data on print, microfilm, microform, and digital holdings of identified collections. Providing, they provide information on archiving or just storage conditions and services and existing agreements. They participate in webinars or teleconferences to develop a five-year plan for expanding current archiving and to formalize existing agreements. The timeline we have developed for the project includes four parallel or concurrent phases, and we have begun work on all but the last phase. For phase one, we have downloaded print bibliographic records for all resources. We are engaged in researching holdings for the material. We will focus on holdings of the project participants for inclusion in the database, but we are gathering data about additional holdings to understand the context in which the holdings of our participants exist. We are developing a format for holdings in preparation for transfer of the data to the, the paper database in 2012. And for phase two, we are finalizing a preservation survey to use as an instrument to document 
baseline archiving conditions and services and hope to distribute um, the survey to project participants for their review in the next week. Based on that review, we will decide on a method for gathering that data. And for phase three, um, on September 14th, CRL hosted the first of five web meetings for the agricultural arm of the project. Topics discussed in that meeting were ownership, retention, validation, disclosure, and access. And future webinars will cover selection of materials, retention, access and services, disclosure and discovery, business model and governance. And dates for those web meetings are on our project web page. For the law side, we are working with members of, of our advisory group to find the best venue for bringing that community, community together to discuss the same issues. For more information, um, please contact me or visit the project web pages and the URLs are on, on the screen. Thanks very much. And next is Marie Waltz. Thank you very much, Amy. Good day, everyone. My name is Marie Waltz. I'm a special projects librarian at the Center for Research Libraries. I've been working on the evaluating and auditing of digital repositories since 2005. Today, I'm going to talk to you a little about how digital preservation services, such as Portico and Hathi Trust, can help to mitigate risks associated with print archiving and mention a few of the risks we have found with these digital repositories in the course of our auditing work. Digital repositories provide more backups in a smaller amount of physical space and they are in the formats patrons want. We are now in the electronic age. Having the ability to electronically archive, search, forward, and repurpose content is what patrons expect from their libraries. Often the electronic version is the version patrons want and the one they will use going into the future. And as we all know, electronic content is only growing. This year, IDC predicted the digital universe will expand by almost 50%. That is the amount of information and content created and stored digitally will grow to seven zettabytes by 2015. A zettabyte is approximately 160 exabytes and currently the internet is only about 500 exabytes or about 2.5 zettabytes. So we're looking at a big increase here. So despite everything we are doing to build print repositories, the digital repository is an important consideration when developing a backup strategy for our content. This is why CRL has begun to audit and certify digital repositories, because digital repositories are going to preserve a lot of the content we are going to need as we move into the future. You may have heard the phrase trusted digital repository and wondered what it means. A 2002 report from the RLG group defines it thus. A trusted digital repository is one whose mission is to provide reliable long-term access to managed digital resources to its des designated community now and in the future. This is CRL's definition as well. We want to see a repository that thinks about its designated community, that is, the future users for whom we are preserving their co this content, and how they have employed the tools that will help users to use and under understand the data over time. We want to see preservation strategies reflected in a repository's mission statement. We want to see plans, policies, and procedures that carry out these strategies. We want to see systems in place that can carry out the testing and archiving requirements of the content the repository is responsible for. All of these expectations are captured in the Trusted Digital Repository Checklist, or the new version, ISO 16363, which was recently approved by the ISO Standards Committee, which is also known as TDR. There are many ways in which a repository can fail to preserve its content, and so there are many metrics to look at when auditing a digital repository. Each repository is different, and the risks associated with the repository will be as well. CRL has formed a panel of audit advisors who represent the various sectors of our membership. The certification advisory panel ensures that the certification process addresses the issues, concerns, and interests of the entire CRL community. The panel includes leaders in collection development, preservation, and information technology. The panel meets several times during the course of an audit, and auditors report findings and observations, which the panel as a whole decides if the repository complies or does not comply with checklist metrics. The panel changes for different repository audits. This is because the repository community is small, and there are times when there are conflicts of interest. CRL has audited and certified both Portico and Hathi Trust as trusted digital repositories. This has affected some aspects of what they do. 
Firstly, they communicate their preservation policies to their subscribers. They also consider preservation when choosing new standards, processes, and technologies. In general, when they make changes to their system, services, and etc., they will take preservation into account. We will be auditing both repositories again and will continue to monitor what they are doing to ensure they remain trusted. In addition, both these services consider print repositories among the solutions librarians should be pursuing, and they offer services and insights to help with this. One service Portico offers that helps with print archiving is a holdings comparison service. This can help you in making decisions about maintaining print holdings of the e-journal content being preserved in Portico. The service is free to participating and non-participating libraries. The service helps librarians to actively manage the preservation status of Portico's digital collections, compare costs to other preservation solutions, and inform library decision making about joining Portico. Also important for print archiving is Portico's coverage, which is expanded by 8,000 to 10,000 titles or more than 10 linear feet of shelving. This new content includes many STEM journals. The more coverage a repository has, the better it is able to meet the needs of its subscribers. However, we did find the Portico repository is not perfect. As coverage increases, the costs for maintaining the repository will as well. These costs may be passed on to subscribers. Also, during the course of our audit, CRL felt there were certain aspects of Portico's digital repository system that were not as well developed as they could be. In particular, because Portico is a dark archive, it is difficult for an outside organization to monitor the content within Portico. Portico does provide an auditing tool for subscribers, however this tool converts the content within the Portico system to the HTML format, thus causing changes to the preserved file. This means the HTML version is not the version being preserved within Portico, so it is not the copy we want to monitor. CRL is working with Portico on a solution to this concern and we hope to resolve it before the next audit. Another concern we found while auditing Portico included the concern that the auditing archive is only available to subscribers of the content. We have also certified Hati Trust's eBooks repository. As Lizanne mentioned in her presentation, Hati Trust wants to help stimulate coordinated print backup efforts for libraries. They, in fact, they say they want to stimulate redoubled efforts to coordinate shared storage strategies among libraries, thus reducing long-term capital and operating costs of libraries associated with the storage and care of print collections. They say in, in adding Hati Trust and related shared storage strategies to a library's portfolio of services, libraries will be able to reduce their local storage and care of print collections. This goal is very timely for librarians. It helps with cost cutting and saves space. However, during the course of our audit, we were concerned that Hati Trust's goal may not be easily reached. In particular, because CRL found that the quality assurance metrics Hati Trust and its partners, such as Google Books and the Internet Archive, make it unlikely that libraries will feel comfortable relying on their digital content without additional electronic and print backups. In fact, Hati Trust itself does not attest to the completeness of the original digitization effort, only that the transmission of this content is assured. Additionally, the pricing model that HathiTrust plans to introduce correlates the overlap between the repository's holdings and the print holdings of the participating libraries. The more correlation between local print holdings and those held digitally in HathiTrust, the greater a library's cost to subscribe. This pricing strategy may increase the pressure on subscribing libraries to divest themselves of print holdings that are also available through HathiTrust. You can read more about HathiTrust and Portico in our audit reports on our website. So some of the risks we identified for Portigo and Hati Trust can be applied to other digital repositories in which you may be investing content or cash. This may include, how can a subscriber be assured that the content within the digital repository is correct and can it be monitored by an outside organization? What are the quality assurance practices of those contributing content to the repository? And what does the repository guarantee in terms of quality? And finally, how stable is the pricing structure and is the repository making decisions which ensure the cost will remain stable? These types of questions are important and help to point out risks which any collection development officer needs to consider when weighing the risks and benefits of buying digital repository services. In particular, being able to independently monitor the digital content is an important consideration for subscribers. For example, HathiTrust is an open archive, so it is easy to see what is in there and if it is usable. 
However, Portico is a dark archive. Subscribers can only access a copy of the content. We can't monitor it directly. If we are to trust digital repositories, they must be allowed to give us access to the content for monitoring purposes. This is one goal of CRL's Print Archives Preservation Registry System paper. This is why we are including content from Portico and Clocks in the paper database. We hope to add additional holdings information for other digital repositories over the project. To conclude, the involvement of CRL members in the CAP panel, interviews, and other feedback ensures our efforts are meeting the needs of the CRL community and researchers in the United States and Canada. We hope you will take the time to look at our reports about digital repositories, databases, and other library services available on our website. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, Amy, and Lizanne for those presentations. Uh, we'd like to open up now to uh, open discussion uh, with our presenters. Please feel free to submit your comments or questions through the online chat uh, for our presenters to address. Uh, Lizanne, if you could unmute again. Uh, we did get a question about your presentation about which libraries are participating in the OCLC pilot. Right, thank you. Um, the, there are um, a relatively small number of libraries participating in the pilot at this point. Um, it's Indiana University, University of Minnesota, University of Oregon, Stanford, UCLA, UCSD, uh, and CRL. I hope I haven't forgotten any. Um, and these, these libraries are entering uh, test records into WorldCat. Uh, in some cases, they've been entered manually through connection. Uh, a couple of them are getting ready to batch load local holding records uh, to to reflect these uh, uh, local these print archiving uh, metadata records, including 583s and, and so forth. And so there are um, there's a uh, maybe 200 at the most records in WorldCat now that have been entered through this pilot. The pilot project is also uh, starting to work on testing some resource sharing scenarios based on the presence of these records now, now that there are some test records in WorldCat. Um, a group of, of among those libraries is starting to, uh, to see how that plays out in terms of uh, of resource sharing and uh, requesting materials and deflecting and processing uh, interlibrary loan requests for that material. The goal is to have the results of the pilot be finished by uh, late fall so that we can announce um, a, a proposed methodology for additional libraries to start to use this, uh, this metadata standard. Okay, great. Um, anybody else with any questions? This is a great opportunity with our presenters or online or uh, here with us um, at CRL if uh, anybody would like to submit any questions at this point. Okay, so we do have a question about um, the analysis tool, the overlap analysis tool that Portico um, is using. And the, there's a question is if um, a library discovers a high level of overlap, um, would they have a, an incentive to just subscribe to Portico? Um, and, and so do they see it as a marketing device? And I really can't speak to that because this is a fairly recent development. Um, I, it is advertised on their website, so I know they're doing it. But I haven't talked to them specifically about this latest um, wrinkle in their service model. So, but I do think it's probably a good idea, and, and it, it is very likely that um, it would help to, um, to encourage people to subscribe to Portico services. Okay, well, it looks like uh, there uh, aren't that many more questions out there, but if something does occur to you later, um, please uh, feel free to contact our presenters. There are their email addresses uh, at crl.edu, so uh, please feel free to follow up with them or really anyone here at, at CRL. We so appreciate your participation uh, in these in these webinars, which is such a great
benefit for our member institutions. Uh, in fact, we do have a lot of webinars coming up. We have one more this year on October 12th is our CRL Collections and Services webinar. This webinar is a really good basic overview on all the collections and services available through CRL. So if you're a new member institution or you're with a member institution but you'd like a refresher or if you have some new staff, uh, you can sign up on our website and uh, it's, it's such a popular webinar. We actually host it a couple of times a year, so we'll be doing it again, as you can see, in June. And then uh, we already have some webinars set up for 2012. And the whole list is on our website, on our calendar page under the About section. And you can also go ahead and mark your calendar for next year's annual meeting on April 20th. Uh, we really value your input into these events. It really helps us uh, modify them and, and make them better yeah, based on your feedback. So we encourage you to fill out our follow-up survey at SurveyMonkey. The link is right there. really won't take that uh, much of your time, I promise, uh, but we really benefit from your input. If you want to review this uh, segment again or if you have colleagues who couldn't attend today who might be interested, I will be posted on our website uh, they usually do it really quickly, usually within a week or on our YouTube channel. And actually, all of our webinars are on our YouTube channel. You can, um, there's really a wealth of presentations on that channel right now. So uh, feel free to visit that page or our website. Or if you want more information on how to find out about these events before they happen, uh, we encourage you to sign up for our online newsletter. That's uh, CRL Connect. And we also have a Facebook page. So please visit us there. Feel free to comment. Uh, and we're always happy to have your feedback. So thank you again for joining us. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon.